Welcome to the Tomorrow's World Today podcast. We sit down with experts, world-changing innovators, creators, and makers to explore how they're taking action to make tomorrow's world a better place for technology, science, innovation, sustainability, the arts, and more. In this episode, George Davison, host of Tomorrow's World Today on the Science Channel, sits down with Dave Alexander, the president of General Atomics Aeronautical Systems, an energy and defense corporation that designs and manufactures unmanned aerial vehicles and radar systems for the U.S. military, as well as commercial applications worldwide. They explore the foresight of its founders, the company's legacy in drone technology, and how innovation continues to drive their contributions to national defense and global surveillance. Now here's George Davison. Welcome to the show. Thank you, George. Thanks for having me. You bet. So, you know, it would probably help our audience to know a little bit about what your company does in general. Uh, could you give us a general feeling for what you do? Well, General Atomics Aeronautical Systems, by its name, is really it's focused on unmanned systems to provide surveillance combined with super long endurance. And so that was kind of our hallmark that really got us going mm-hmm. in the beginning days. Our, we're privately held. Uh, by the Blue family, and Neil Blue and his brother had this idea way back, you know, with the advent of uh, GPS and the long endurance, you know, cheaper platforms that could go out there and, and persist and provide surveillance so over long periods of time as a very effective way for the military to have eyes on what's going on and make, you know, good decisions right. based on that. So we're, we're talking drones. And, you know, the, the field of drones, that's a, that's a promising and upcoming area of, the, uh, of our economy. Is that fair to say? I think it's fair to say around the world right mm. now that um, there are um, populations aren't what they used to be and growing. Um, getting trained pilots is not as easy as it used to be. Mm-hmm. And so I really, you'll see a lot of national defense strategies around different you know, nations around the world really embracing unmanned because it's, it's it's their future. They see a dwindling population in some areas, and, and it, it's how you multiply. It's a force multiplier to go unmanned. That's wonderful. And your position there is, what, what do you do as president? Well, that's a good question. I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> I light fires, I put them out, I uh, take the trash out when needed, you know. But I, yeah, I have to, you know, you do what it, what's needed. Um, I started out 29 years ago when the company was really small. As an engineer, you know, my trade, you know, I'm an engineer by trade. Mm-hmm. I've been doing uh, aerospace engineering unmanned my whole career unmanned for 45 years now. And uh, 29 years ago, I started with General Atomics. And, uh, you know, I headed up design for many, many years. And, and then I made president about nine years ago. And, and now they let me do engineering things every now and then. I see. Yeah. Well, that sounds like it's kind of logical, right? I mean, you're having an engineering background, dedicating all those years in there, you put enough years in, you have enough knowledge to start running things. Yep, yeah, yeah. and no, it's a, it's a rewarding, rewarding business to be in because there's a bigger purpose to what mm-hmm. you're doing when you're you know, linked up with uh, saving lives on the battlefield, you're linked up with um, saving lives in civilian applications. And so, you know, getting up in the morning has a different purpose in life. And so it it, not only is it fun as an engineer to design aircraft and sensors and radars, but it also has a purpose to it. That's great. Yeah. Anytime you can chase a noble cause in life, it really isn't work anymore, is it? That's right. Yeah. It gets those feet out of bed in the morning. You mentioned a little bit of the history, but uh, there are two brothers that started this business, correct? Correct. Correct. So... Can you give us a quick summary on like where did the idea for the business come from back in those days? And when was that? When was the company started? Well, the company started in the early 90s. And um, it was, uh, again, the vision of uh, Neil Blue and his brother, uh, Lyndon Blue. And they're both aviation enthusiasts. They're both, they're both pilots. Mm. And they really saw the, the vision of the future and in many ways. The unmanned, persistent ISR you know, surveillance platform you know, was really their vision. Hmm. I think when you combine that with the first advanced concept technology demonstration program that we had uh, with the joint services, that's where Predator finally, you know, took hold. And how it took hold was over their horizon control through satellite uh, combined with, you know, real-time actionable uh, strike 
combined together. Yeah. So you had a platform that could fly for a day and watch and keep an eye on the soldiers on the ground and when needed, take action. That's and it, it went, went big from there, mm -hmm. went big. Yeah, this is a sizable company now. So from the 90s till now, how many employees do you have? Like 9,500 employees. 9,500. Yeah, we're operating um, 78 locations around the world currently. Mm. And uh, we've flown over eight and a half million flight hours. And every year we fly another 500,000 flight hours. So yeah, it's a busy company. It's a lot of locations, a lot of employees. What kind of customers? Is the government mostly your, your uh, customer base? Yeah, almost, almost 100%. I mean, there's some civil applications and, and uh, border protection and things like that. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's some areas where, you know, where a manned aircraft can't get because of the endurance and, you know, things like railway inspection and, um, you know, uh, oil derricks that are out in the ocean real far out. Then, you know, this has an application in the civil world. That work. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And you said, you mentioned earlier you were in, in design earlier in your career. So during the process of figuring out the future, you know, and engineering the future, mm -hmm. there's a need or somebody sees a need for something and takes a chance. It sounds like the Blues Brothers took that adventure on, right? Oh, they did, yeah. And so then w earlier in your career, were you, you already were an engineer when you got there. Yeah, prior to joining with General Atomics, I did uh, about 16 years doing air launch decoys mm. and high speed, high altitude targets, uh, mostly for the Navy, but uh, military applications. Interesting. And that's where I really caught the bug, you know, of things that fly, if you goof it up, there's nobody on board, you know, so it's just money at the end of the day and <laughs> off <right>. you go. <laughs> but, you know, like I say, the, every aspect of engineering and design is hit with these platforms and that's what makes it all that enjoyable. Yeah, I imagine it's pretty complex technology tying all, all those sensors, AI, everything together to try and make these devices function as planned. Oh yeah, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a discipline that you don't learn overnight, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. And you know, I think of the early days, things we were producing and chasing them down the runway as, you know, things were falling off the platform because they weren't <laughs> quite working right to yeah. where we're at today. Uh, you know, it's a big difference. So you, it's, it's not something you learn overnight. And an unmanned aircraft is quite a bit different than a manned aircraft. There's, mm -hmm. there's things you have to do fundamentally different so that you know exactly what's going on inside that airplane. You don't have a human in the cockpit, you know, feeling that the engine isn't running right or mm -hmm. uh, seeing that he's running into bad weather or safe separation from manned aircraft. So these are all the things you have to bring to the, to the platform that are complex, you know, complexities that the manned aircraft doesn't have. So when you first start to get through the process of, you know, configuring a solution, it makes sense that things aren't working so well, pieces are coming off or whatever, and you solve those problems. Eventually, though, have you been able to get it to the point where it's pretty simple to maintain, pretty simple to operate, or are we still in a very complex uh, situation? Well, I think, uh, no, I think it's, um it's complex made simple would be the Good. way I, the way i would say it mm -hmm. we've gotten rid of hydraulics was the first thing we did everything that moves on the airplane is done through electromagnetic uh, actuators mm -hmm. and i call it an all-electric airplane and by doing so uh, the amount of maintenance just falls just unbelievable and so to give you an example uh, one of our customers took one of our airplanes and flew 7080 hours in one calendar year and if you do the math on that, it's 82% of the time that airplane's airborne. Flight, wow. Airborne, 82% of the time, around the clock. And you, you only get there when your availability's 99% mm -hmm. you know, on. And that's what an all-electric airplane uh, does for you. Interesting. You're Great. still burning fuel for propulsion, but I'm just saying the, the rest of the platform. Understood. Yeah. yeah. Understood. So what about the conversation that you, like, Confidentiality and security, it's got to be a sensitive subject matter for somebody in your line of work and what you do. I mean, if I was to go to work at your operation, uh, how do you, like, is there a process that you go through to make sure that I'm a good guy and I'm not going to steal your technology? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you, uh, depending on what program you're on, you're going to have to get cleared through a lot of, um, you know, secret to top secret to special access. and That's all a piece of... Uh, getting read into 
the programs for okay. sure. So if, as I would be inside, <clears throat> you know, General Atomics, as I go up the ladder of understanding the entire system, I guess my clearances have to keep going up and up. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it, well, depending on what you're doing in the company, but yeah, I mean, if you're in charge of running a whole platform, mm -hmm. you, you definitely have to have all the clearances. Yeah, usually like here at Inventionland, back when we were configuring systems, I broke systems up so that they couldn't understand what they were doing. And then when it came yeah. over, there was like a translation. And it, it keeps technology pieces separated, which just helps to you know, keep security. Yeah. You guys seem to be pushing hard on the future and keep pushing this technology to a, another higher level. And something's got to drive that, right? So is that a personal drive of yours? Is it uh, something that the owners are saying, no, we're going to keep doing that? Or is it your customers demanding even more? It's complicated, but I would say the, you know, our owners are pressing us to come up with what's needed out there. So there's a huge amount of internal research money that's poured back into the company every year mm -hmm. so that we can innovate and bring new products forward. And a lot of the platforms now are going into new missions, right, into the maritime role. There's no need to have manned aircraft doing these really complex missions out there. You can do it unmanned. So we're moving into the maritime uh, mission big time. Hmm. There's, uh, I would say, a multi-domain operation. You know, for years we were over in the central part of Asia and it, the airspace was owned by us. Well, now it's not so much owned by us. There's, you know, missiles out there that can pop up and grab you. So now that we have what we call multi-domain operations, so we have special sensors that allow you to look all the way to the horizon from altitude let you stand off and survives. And, uh, and then when if you do want to combat ID something, you send an expendable in. So it's a mothership and then a small UAV. So mm -hmm. it's unmanned being controlled by unmanned. And that way you can have multi-domain oper operations in what we call contested airspace. That makes a lot of sense. So you've got sensors looking out to see what's next, then try to identify how to tackle that challenge, right? Right. Yeah. What has been the biggest technological advancement during your time with the company? I think our latest would, would what we call Sky Guardian, Sea Guardian. And it's our latest um, next generation MQ-9 platform. And this platform was designed from the get-go to have every bit of certification that a manned aircraft has so that we can fly in, in the, just airspace with any other aircraft so we could file and fly and um, pretend like you're just any other platform out there, manned or unmanned. Mm -hmm. So this, this new Sky Guardian, Sea Guardian aircraft, uh, the company put considerable money in it, have all the certification, and then they took it one step further and designed a radar that looks forward as if you had a pilot in the cockpit. So now, you know, through the windscreen, a pilot could see and avoid, you know, other aircraft out there, mm -hmm. but he can't see through clouds. Now we have a radar in there that can actually see through clouds, see just as far as the human eye, and then have all that automated and tell the pilot on the ground, don't fly here, fly there, so you can avoid traffic. So I think the biggest innovation there is that we're integrating MQ-9, what we call MQ-9 Bravo, Sky Guardian, Sea Guardian. That will be the aircraft that's integrated into airspace just like any other. So it'll file and fly just like a regular platform. You know, uh, manned aircraft, and, and that's huge. That's a lot of technology that it took to get us there. And that's doing what for forces on the ground? Well, there's a lot of countries that won't fly a, a combat aircraft uh, over their crowded cities. And what this does is it allows these aircraft to fly in their airspace. So a crowded airspace like anywhere in Europe, these airplanes could fly mm. and not have to have special restrictions put on them. Very nice. Yeah, and be, you know, that extra set of rigor to be just, you know, they're big airplanes. They're 13,500 pound gross takeoff aircraft. So, you know, if one of those comes down, it's a big deal. It's a, you know? Right. So it's got to be safe. Um, so we've talked a little bit about homegrown observations and identifying challenges to come up with new, um, let's call it new drones that would uh, fit the market needs, right? What about when outside technology is developed? like let's say AI, and how does that incorporate itself into your world and alter your course of business, let's say? Well, I mentioned the maritime. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So the Maritime platform has uh, surface search radar on it. It has um, special sensors to listen to um, or look for radars. So we're looking for radars, we're looking for ships, we're looking for uh, any kind of signals coming off of uh, battleships. When you put all this together, the amount of data that comes off the platform now is just not full motion video as it was in the past. Now it's, it's a lot of information that has to get boiled down into something usable. Mm -hmm. And so um, General Atomics acquired this company called CCRI, but what, what they do is, is they provide a common operating picture, take all that data and correlate it into something that makes sense. Mm. So if you've got a thousand ships out there, you can put AI on this and weed it down to a dozen things to worry about. And this is where AI on the sensor part is really going to pay off. You can weed through what you don't need to worry about right. and focus on ships doing strange things like, you know, two ships out in the middle of the ocean side by side. You know, they shouldn't, ships don't do that. Right. And ships doing zigzag, you know ships turning off their transponders and turn them back on and they turn them back on and now they're a pleasure boat you know things like this mm -hmm. um, you can catch if you had to have people doing that it would just be you'd be overwhelmed with people sitting in front of monitors trying to figure all this out that makes sense so this is huge that's huge um, the other place i'd say for ai and autonomy which is going to be really really big in the future is for our air-to-air -air combat aircraft and this is a new uh, program that we're working right now so we're not looking at the ground anymore we're looking out air-to-air -air combat so we're shooting air-to-air -air missiles mm -hmm. and you want these things to swarm together and not have to have somebody flying them so you put them into an autonomy mission six twelve they all talk to each other and they go out as a mesh mm -hmm. and now that's where the ai and autonomy really are a multiplier so you got one person on the loop telling many aircraft what to go do and they go out there and hunt mm -hmm. and uh, you know give you air superiority and if you lose one out of the six then you still have five you're running that's right mm -hmm. and there's nobody on board to worry about yeah, exactly. when you're that's, done yeah mm -hmm. that sounds like yeah. real high tech yep nice that's stuff. Uh, called collaborative combat aircraft and and that's a program we've been working on for about a year now with the u.s mm -hmm. air force so super huge for us if you were to think about not so much your company, mm -hmm. but the industry as a whole, where, what do you think the next biggest area to tackle is going to be in the field of technology around this area? Well, one area that um, I think needs to be looked at is hybrid propulsion. Mm. And from that, um, I think it'll be game changing for the amount of endurance that you can get on a specific size of, a, of an aircraft. The same size and weight, triple the endurance. So when you say hybrid, are you saying solar, electric, uh, with diesel, or what, what are we talking about? I'm saying uh, a highly efficient direct inject diesel engine, mm -hmm. um, very, very efficient, coupled with motors that are 98% efficient, mm -hmm. uh, driving ducted vans. And I believe that's, um, that's going to be a game changer. Three, three times the efficiency wow. of a buried... Uh, turbo fan. So we're looking out how many years before that's reality? Well, for us, I'm saying about three. Mm. Yeah, we're working hard on it. That's great. Yeah, it's something new, it's something unique. I think we can make it happen. Well, thank you for coming in, Dave. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, everybody, that's another edition of Tomorrow's World Today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tomorrow's World Today podcast. Join us next time as we continue to explore the worlds of inspiration, creation, innovation, and production. Discover more at tomorrowsworldtoday.com and connect with us on social media at TWT Explore. And find us wherever podcasts are available.